Hello and welcome to this Conversations on Groong episode. I'm Aspet Bedrosian and Bedros Afeyan and I have with us film producer, director and actor Michael Gurjian, whose latest movie, Amerigatsi, was shortlisted for an Oscar nomination. Hello, Michael. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Thanks for having me, guys. Hello, Michael and Aspet. I want to enthusiastically say how much I like this movie of Michael's. It's first and foremost a labor of love, a journey to some version of Armenianhood. It is a journey towards learning about the mores of being an Armenian, a contemporary Armenian or a 1930s Armenian, close enough. The hell of Soviet era Armenians, the duped repats, the Russian brown nosing local apparatchiks, the wise old men in the prison yard, underlining the foibles of Armenians, the innocent young brides, abused, ignored, mistreated, yet loyal, dependable, helpful, committed, the drunk prison guards and watchtower officers, the repats who suffered horribly, especially when from a rich, opulent country such as the US, but as Armenians, adaptable by necessity, seemingly naturally adaptable, possessing indomitable spirits, fighters without arms, lovers without partners, singers sans voice, dancers sound rhythm, all painters without tools or training, Armenians mocking the serious lies, grave proclamations, betrayals, and intrigues that lie behind Western and Eastern cultural currencies too dirty to touch. To be Armenian, as Sarayan has so amply pointed out, is to fly above those mores, to be steeped in manners, but not active lies and cruelty, quiet suffering and struggling to persevere by always learning, always picking up scraps and building giant monoliths for a brief shining moment in history, only to rebuild it again, later, again and again. The movie Amerigatsi amply embodies this ethos. The true compass of a people discovered by this Kherjugurak, poor and burning, stripped of all dignity Armenian, dubbed Charlie, as the authorities want to see him as the tramp Charlie Chaplin. Michael, how influential was Roberto Berini and his brand of humor or satire on your scenario yourself, Amerigatsi? In particular, I have in mind his famous work, Life is Beautiful, La Vita e Bella. Bedros, where were you six months ago? I sh you should have written my press release for me. I would have liked to, had thank you known me. <laughs> uh, uh, thank you for all of that. Yeah, uh, Benini. Well, I, of course, saw uh, Life is Beautiful when it came out. You know, I, there were, uh, I definitely, I would say other films that were a little more influential in terms of when I was writing Americanzi. Uh -huh. um, but definitely Benini, I mean, there's a certain sort of brand of tragedy comedy that's not easy to do. And that's why there's so few, I mean, there's not a lot of other references besides uh, Benini uh, or Chaplin per se in terms of film. Uh, because it's just not easy. The other, um, I would say more of an influence for me was Kutstaritsa, um, the Balkan filmmaker who did Underground and Black Cat, White Cat. He has a tone that I've always loved, which is very playful, not necessarily straight realism, um, which is something I feel like is somewhat of a trap for uh, American filmmakers, that everything has to be this... You know, serious, serious film has to be straight realism and, and everybody, yeah, everybody whisper acting. And like, I, I feel like there's so much more room in cinema that isn't played with. And so for me, that tone was one that I felt in terms of the kind of story I wanted to tell, which I, I was trying for a long time to find something that would be for Armenians to start that would be enjoyable to watch. Um, I feel like so many films, the, the films that we've seen, Armenian films tend to be in this, you know, it's, they're hard to watch. They're very tragic and, you know, most are about the genocide and 
there's a kind of a wallowing and pain that, you know, is important cathartically, but also it's just not enjoyable. And so, yeah, very tough to watch. Yeah. At the same time, I didn't want to make, you know, the other end of the spectrum is these sort of broad comedies that are silly and goofy. And, uh, you know, I could have made my big fat Armenian wedding, but for me to find something that had depth my big it, fat armenian but, prison wedding yeah exactly so i wanted to find something that you know a, a way of making a film that would have depth but also be enjoyable uh, just enjoyable to experience and sure. and in that well, regard there's a part two to that question how about the voyeur motif the hitchcockian or almodovarian yeah. or Lynchian or egoyan voyeur motif what role do these do these movie makers have on your construction of Amidagasi? Well, I would say actually that really came more from two influences. One was uh, there's a, a German film called The Lives of Others, uh, yeah. which uh, was Leben der Anderen. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah, yeah, and relationship in that that's about a Stasi um, guy who's eavesdropping on a playwright, and yeah. in doing so, you know the guy's they suspect is a dissident and is spreading anti-communist propaganda. And so this, this guy who's listening in on him can't help, but over time sort of develop, uh, you know, starts to care about this guy. And that, that idea for me is really, there's a version of that in Americazzi in terms of for Charlie, he's observing this, this couple and, you know, just by watching them, starts to care but voyeurism i would say the other aspect of that is like i said instead of my big fat greek wedding where or my big fat armenian wedding where i could have you know thrown a bunch of armenianness at you and go you know be, be like the guy in the in the prison yard who's saying you know you know yeah, armenians yeah, did exactly. this and that you know i could have made a whole movie that's just like that and you know if you're not armenian you're gonna be like all right great whatever um, voyeurism, I felt, was a way in which I could cause, get an audience to lean in and want to know more. And so, you know, the construct is, here's this Armenian guy, like many Armenians in the diaspora, who's longing for his roots and is looking at Armenia symbolically as like, oh, when I get there, it'll, I'll feel so Armenian and I'll experience all the Armenianness I'm longing for and and he gets there and it's the Soviet Union and it's stripped of of all of that and here are these basically Soviet citizens and and then from the window of his prison looking into this apartment there is hidden everything he was been been looking for and and shown to you in a way where you just barely catch corners of it you barely hear the songs and you you see little bits of things and by doing it that way, my my hope was that, especially for non-Armenians, we'd be interested. We would want to know more. So that's that's kind of why that device. Yeah, and it's actually richer than that. You're, I think you're underselling it. Um, the the real key there, I mean, I completely agree, but I'd like to add sure. that he grows. That's the beauty of it, is that this is what I mean from from. Uh, Peshranks from from little morsels of snippets, he constructs a lifestyle for himself. That is to say, mm -hmm. a routine in which it's not stagnant, but it's growing, and it's it's got inf many many more layers to it. Which is, <clears throat> as the relationship that he's watching stagnates and deteriorates, his involvement increases because he's just committed to this is my you know my, this is my tv program this is my yeah. armenia lesson this is my you know how to forget about the bold uh mocking uh guards and, and all so so that juxtaposition you know it's like in many other movies you know there'll be a little mouse in the prison uh, cell and then the guy will just you know tend to that mouse not because he has any interest in mice but because mm -hmm. it's a thing he can do you know, and can I yeah. add one thing? Unlike a movie like Rear Window, where honestly, we don't care that much about what's going on in the windows over there. Here, Charlie is actually really getting into the lives of these folks. He's participating in it to the point where I thought 
he understands the wife better than the husband and understands the husband better than the wife does. Yeah. He was so involved in them to try and send messages. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, here, here, here's the aspect of that is, you know, a less Armenian and more universal sort of theme of the film is Charlie's in prison, but he's, it's <laughs> my DP, uh, my cinematographer, uh, this was his, his dream. He said, you know, your movie is about someone who, someone, a prisoner who we find out is more free than the people outside the prison. Makes himself more free. Yeah. And that uh, is everybody in life. You know, we live life and we, oh, I'm, I hate my wife and I'm this and I'm angry. I don't like my house and my dog. Until you lose it all. And then you go, oh, God, we don't see what we have. We don't see what's there in front of us because we don't see ourselves. And when and in this scenario, you have someone watching and seeing and and going and longing for everything this other guy has. And in that, we get us, we we start to see like, oh, what we take for granted, what we we're not what we have in our lives. We're often unaware of the fact that we're what we have. When, it's when because. It's we live in a society where we're programmed, I mean, in the West, you know, commercials and things, to just constantly think about what we don't have. Yeah, sure. What we ought to have. Now, when you have nothing, everything is a get. So, to this yes. guy, you know, the fact yes. that his bed rolls up enough that he can, I mean, his, his resourcefulness is, of course, again, very Charlie Chaplin, Benini-esque, et cetera, et cetera. And it's necessary. I mean, without resource, imagine if this guy's a paraplegic, there goes your movie. <laughs> So, oh, right. you know, I go back to uh, Burt Lancaster looking at mice. But let me let's let's address speaking. I, I talked about mice. Now let me address the elephant in the room, okay. which is Russia, okay. Soviet goons outing their barbarity and how Armenians in Armenia today are eating this up. They they love this narrative. The feeling today of betrayal in the hands of those oppressors who seduced mm -hmm. the entire nation, among others, into believing the Russian bear was protecting them to awaken. <laughs> to what blood-sucking devils Russians always were as emperors and will be. That sentiment sells today in Armenia. But what will these Armenians do without the Russians? How will they defend themselves against the much worse Turks and their war babies, the Azeris? Do you uh, have any comments about this relationship between the evolving maturation of the relationship between sure hiring russian armenians and people like us who go whoa 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 <laughs> take a look at this a little more carefully sure well i'll start by just prefacing that i i am not i purposely do my best to avoid politics as a filmmaker i mean it's impossible to completely but i always ho strive for hitting uh, deeper aspects of humanity that are more universal. Um, and so in that, like with this film, uh, well, I'll tell you it this way, sentiment you're talking about towards Russians, I would not say Russian people, I would say Russian policy. Mm -hmm. um, because for me, I have so many Russian friends, the the actors that were in the film that played Dmitry and Sona, they're Russian actors, beautiful artists, I consider them artists, they're not, they're not representation of of this of those policies per se so when i first the script in 2018 and when i first went to armenia to the ministry of culture and the cinema center to try to get support and funding they reviewed the script and i had to do an interview with them on on zoom and they only had one question and remember this is 2018 their one question was why does dimitri why does the bad guy have to be Russian? And I was like, uh, <laughs> what well, else would he be? Uh, this is the story. Um, you know, it's, it's, I'm not, and I wouldn't necessarily say that Dimitri is the bad guy of the film. I, I would say Soviet bu bureaucracy is, yeah. um, not, not a Russian guy. Uh, the system is the bad guy here. Anyways, they were concerned that point rightfully so because there they were very concerned about uh, anything that was anti-russian or or that would somehow look bad to russia they let me do it they you know they said okay you know we're not going to mess with you make your movie well the sentiment after 2020 <laughs> yes. uh, and especially now yes. said, has shifted tremendously 
Yeah. And I don't know. It's a Question. complex situation. I'm not, you know, I, again, I'm not a politician and I, and it is a tough, tough situation that I feel like, especially in the, for people that don't know it, I think this is the biggest problem. You know, I've had non-Armenians who know very little about what's going on go, oh yeah, Armenia, that's like part of the, that's part of Russia, right? They're like, you know, part of those Russian people and, you know, getting coupled in with, with those, those policies. And then like, we're, you know, the country is stuck in between two, in between yeah. things. And it's such a difficult situation. I have to say, look, you know, Armenia, probably the country probably wouldn't exist without Russia for uh, right. what, what they, what they did at mm -hmm. the same time. We're like, you know, we're a little puppet and, and we've been played. We're constantly played. Um, right. And that's, it's, it's off. It's an awful situation to be in. So I don't have any answers, but I know it's, 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 it's difficult. And um, in the film, as I said, I don't look at any people as being right and wrong. Uh, the behavior and honestly, even, okay. So if you remember in the movie, there's a character, uh, Melikov, he's got little round glasses. Uh -huh. um, he's the guy who beats uh, or yeah. has Tigran beat Charlie. I re actually wrote that he's, he is actually meant to be a Russified Armenian. Many people look at it and go, oh, he's a Russian. No, he's he's an Armenian. Oh, yeah. um, and Melikov, I just, I read about like, um, that was a common Armenian name that was uh, Malikian. Malikian. Trans yeah, Russified. Um, but yeah, there were many, you know, of a generation who were born in the Soviet Union and grew up, you know, that's who they became. And they were just as much of a part of the problem. So anyways... I would say it's a complex issue and I look at even today with what's happened in Artsakh and it is those policies and that type of system that really has created such a terrible situation over there. Returning to more technical matters, I'd also like to explore the humor and its myriad subtle layers in this movie. The high Stancy's permanently sarcastic humor the Amerigazzi's more in-your-face humor, such as a clown's role in cooling of hostilities, or the many genres of pity humor. Uh, would you care to comment on the sprinkling of humor throughout this movie? There's a style of humor that I think has dominated American cinema lately, which is a sort of self-referential and almost nihilistic version of humor that nothing is serious, um, We'll make fun of everything, inclu including our, including the fact that we're making a movie, and it works. The problem with it is that it kills the ability to have any emotion. It's funny and it's good, you know. Ah, I'm laughing, but to actually care about things, you can't do this. And so, in Americazzi, for me, I had to find this. The humor and the different levels of humor that you talked about, they're all done in a way where we still can come back to a place where we believe enough or we care enough about the characters that we can feel for what's going on. And that's a tricky, it was definitely a tricky thing to do that took me a while in the edit to be able to find it. But, you know, one minute, you know, the higher parts of humor of like, it's almost slapstick at points. I'm running around yeah. in an earthquake with a stork egg, you know, and then five minutes later, three minutes later, I'm getting beaten. It, it It's not easy to do, but I don't know. I wouldn't necessarily, I didn't like map out. I, I did most of, most of that finding of the tone and the humor in the film uh, was just testing, like trying things out. Um, and getting getting feedback even more so more, even more authentic i'd like to ask you about the corridors and cold walls filming and color choices of this movie mm -hmm. so well thought out and juxtaposed that i would like to learn more between your set designer dp and you how did you come up with the looks of the interior and exterior scenes in the prison and prison yard well, I remember when I was writing the script, uh, talking to my friend Artsvi Bakshinian, who's a scholar over in Armenia, 
who I've been friends with for years, and asking, he grew up in the Soviet Union and asking him about these times. And he said, you know, the one thing I remember the most is we didn't have color. Everything was gray. <laughs> Everything was just like this, like various versions of gray. Not just emotionally. Yeah. And so a base concept from the get go was to really make everything in the prison cold and as in a sort of greenish there was a sort of green tone that I feel like I, a lot of Soviet pictures that I've seen, uh, there's like a, a sickening sort of greenish gray that we kind of went for. And then to push against that, the apartment, everything was warm. Um, we tried to make that as warm as possible. So, so another question I have is about the music and the soundscape. How did all that meticulous tapestry come about? Which composers or arrangers helped? What compromises? What happy coincidences and serendipity? What was left on the floor? Um, well, there's, I would say, three, perhaps four different layers to the music in the film. There's the score, and that was composed by Andronik Barbarian and was recorded with the National Philharmonic. Andronik came on a little bit later but the idea of using him and bringing him on, he's, you know, he grew up there. His father is a famous composer. And really finding the feel and sound of Soviet, uh, of Russian, there's a tone to it, the feel to it that's very specific that he, you know, instinctually knows how to do. We did not plan on having the National Philharmonic. That came later as a sort of as we made the film and more people got involved, it sort of snowballed into more people wanting to help. And the National Philharmonic thankfully agreed. I think this is the first film they've ever done music for. The whole orchestra? Um, How big was the orchestra, just for the record? Uh, oh, 80, 100, how many people? Uh, I saw, the, I didn't go because it was COVID, but right. the videos they sent back to me, yeah, it's like an 80 piece orchestra. I don't, I don't know how many, how big, but yeah wow. full orchestra Marvelous. um so there's that then there is the folk music and the folk music in the film mostly was composed and arranged by um uh mikhail Voskanian, who is a tar player very well-known tar player and jazz musician he came on er before he, he was involved before we shot the film uh sarge tankian who's one of our producers with him we ended up we found mikhail and Serge helped compose a few of the, the folk pieces that are in the film as well. Then when I was editing, I found this choir, um, the Narian Choir, I think their, their name is. I just on YouTube, I was, you know, when I edited, when I edit, I just, I go online and just pull music from everywhere and try things out and mess with things. I found them on YouTube, maybe something like that. And it's a choir that takes uh, traditional Armenian songs and arranges them for vocal, just vocals. Right. Um, acapella. Yeah, acapella. And it's very beautiful. And so, I don't know, there's four or five pieces in the film from them. They happen to be neighbors of uh, Andronik Barbarian. So when I brought him up to Andronik, he was like, oh, yeah, I'll go next door and, and ask, see if they'll uh, be involved. So that was great. They went to the um, studio and re redid yeah. whatever they, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, a few pieces we used were pre-recorded that they had already recorded, but then they um, they went into the studio and I think did two or three new ones for us. There's an Armenian um, and, uh, musical interlude I like to interject here, which is yeah. that my wife and I, for instance, always know what baloney it is when some movie about Jesus or movie about Romans will always use Duduk. You know, it's now become uh, the, 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 the way you it, say it, It's almost like a cliche at this it's point. A, yeah, in the minute, dun, 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 oh, shit, somebody's going to die. You know, some very <laughs> negative thing is going to happen kind of thing in all of these movies, except in yours, which is wonderful. So I want to commend you <laughs> for not going to the way of, you know, the dude constantly uh, accompanying them. That was marvelous. And the brilliance of the unheard musical festivities in that apartment that's being filmed which was in itself joyous right you, you stuck to your obviously to your own musical uh plan even though some other music was being played in that in that room that he was observing which he could never hear yeah 
So that was yeah, um, exceptionally good. The, I, I mentioned my friend uh, Arts Feedback Chinian. He he when when I first wrote the script, I showed it to him, and I didn't know I would you know Tigran the character in the apartment. I wanted him to be you know play an instrument, and I was like, what should you, and Arts Feedback said, as long as it's not the Dudu. Exactly. Oh no, no, no. come yeah, on! How's he yeah. going to seduce a? You don't seduce a woman with a dudu. I mean, this is, you got to understand this. And when I you know, got a hot woman like that, come on, not dudu. Yeah, but, but he well, did he, play he, that thing with that, you know, in his arm, which is very that was very phallic. I thought it was very effective, you know, seductive. Well, um, yeah, the tar is. Um, yeah, he yeah. he went. Uh, Hovik, the guy who played Tigran, went to Armenia probably two months before we shot and worked with uh, Mikael to learn how to play enough to be able to do that one song that he does. So wait, there's one more layer of music that I would, I would mention, which uh -huh. is there's all this music that's being played over the loudspeakers yes. in the yard. Yes. And that is actual. So I, when I was editing, I was just hunting around and I think it was like called Russian records.com or something. There is a treasure trove of Soviet music uh, that was so Stalin basically ordered all of the different states or areas to make music about him. And so there's all this music um, about not just about Stalin, but about communism, about. And so uh, in the film, there are. Yeah, when they're waiting in line to get beaten up. There, yep. I, I love the way you do that. And then they have to listen to Stalin the father, Stalin the father. That's hilarious. Stalin John, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, but all of this is actual from the 1930s and 40s um, recordings of Armenian songs or songs sung in Armenian with Armenian instrumentation, but that are all about communism and Stalin. So yeah, getting back to Dikran, um, the, the guard with the mustache and the heft and the need to paint, how did you get the hat? What what inspired you to put that big white woolen shepherd's hat on his head while he's playing? I mean, that was just visually amazing, but what, what kind of sexual ritual was that that he was trying to pursue his woman? He put that hat on. <laughs> Got it. it's I don't know if it was a play. sexual ritual. <laughs> well, no, he, was, uh, he was chasing her. So, uh, well, um, uh, he, uh, yeah, I think in the script I had when uh, Charlie first sees the apartment, I wanted a scene where he sees the apartment and there's this guy there and we don't really understand what's going on. And he's drunk and he's like his wife's trying to get him to go to bed. And when Hovik was you know, we were going through costumes or whatever. The costumer had all this crazy, all these hats. And, and he found this big giant shepherd's hat. He was like, oh, yeah, when I'm drunk, I wear this. So that's kind of how that came about. <laughs> so that was improvisation. Well, kind of. I mean, it was based on what was written. But, you know, when you when you start putting a film together, you get creative. and Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. I, I love that. That magic is what it's all about, really. You know, you don't want to. If you filmed what you actually wrote, I think I personally think that would be a, a, a disappointment. But anyway, as for the acting, it was joyous and very much a success. No weak links. Everyone giving it a college go. Speak to your casting, rehearsals, gelling of styles. Is that just editing room magic or did you have it on film while shooting? Or is it that the cast got it and brought it? I would say all of the above. Um started directing uh, because I, I was an actor first. And the reason I started directing mostly is because I like working with actors. My focus as a director usually is in a, is for the most part around performance and helping to get good performances. From there, casting, you know, we took some time to cast and find the right character, find, find the right people for each role. And then on set, not just with the actors, but with every, I, I try my best to collaborate as a director. And instead of going, well, this is where we're going. This is what we know. This is what, what it has to be, you know, with the production designer or the DP, I like trying to find stuff together with some, with the other artists and with the actors, they do the same. So I would say a fair amount of every performance had as much to do with what I wrote as whatever the actor brought to the character. I mean, it you know, the smaller roles, 
are more you know smaller you know, more subtle in terms of what people brought but um even in the i would say one of the more nuanced aspects there's a a woman at usc um who does a podcast on uh language um shushan um Garabedian? yeah uh and we she talked about i talked to her about you know a lot of the accents and dialects in the film are very very accurate um this is something that i you know i don't I don't speak well. And so I relied heavily on my producers and the actual actors to, to work on this. But she, what she pointed out is the, so obviously in the yard, the most of the repatriates are speaking Western, but there's even aspects of like a Syrian, you know, the, the, the old guy who's telling me about stuff, he says a few things that are very kind of Syrian based. She was saying, pointing out how the way in which the guards spoke Russian in front of the Russian characters or spoke Armenian in front of the Russian versus when they were not in front of the Russian characters. All of these little things are things that to my ear, I can't hear, but they, the actors really worked on and brought to, to each of the roles. And with the Russian actors as well, they spent a long time taking, you know, what was originally written in English, then translated into Russian. And then they did a lot of work to push the dialogue into what, how people would sound in that time period, mm -hmm. how they would speak uh, then. So, so yeah, I would I would give a lot of credit to the actors for all that. Yeah, Michael, the the acting was superb. Yourself as Charlie, Nelly as Sona, Hovik Kershkerian, I think, was Dikran, Michael Truchin as the Soviet Army husband. I could go on and on because there were so many memorable performances. Can you talk a little bit about how you direct these actors? especially in the context of also directing. Do you have a style that you subscribe to or that you ascribe to yourself? I wouldn't say like I I have a style per se or a, I've just been on so many sets as an actor mm -hmm. uh, that I've, I mean, I've learned as much from the bad sets as the good sets or the, oh, yeah. the directors who know what they're doing versus the ones that don't. I think it comes mostly from that is... I would say as a foundation for me, if I would, if I was to say I have a style of some kind, everything for me starts with what is the vibe on set and setting a tone that feels safe and free to, for, for an actor, because you have situations where, you know, when you say safe, young, you mean safe to create. Yeah. To, to, to not be bad. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's so easy to be bad on it's it's easy to make an actor perform uh, because you have a situation where you have all of this money and all of these people and all this pressure building up to a point and where then you go, OK, now the camera's right here and action go. And it's like, ah, I, I, I somehow have to be natural and be myself. And you've got all this stuff kind of. Right. Saying, you know, uh, making it difficult. And so finding ways to not have that happen, because so much of it's not about like helping and like going, oh, this is how, you know, you want to be good in the scene. Well, this is what you need to do. No, it's more about pulling things away, getting rid of all of this pressure and distraction, allowing people to, to actors to just feel a sense of freedom and naturalness and and to not have all that that worry and pressure so so if you look back which directors would you say have influenced your journey and and you know guided you uh in in your thought space well there's a director that um i did a movie called slc punk with named james marandino um who i learned a lot from uh richard attenborough who i did uh, chaplin with the movie about charlie chaplin he had a very he did a million takes, but at the same time, he was good at just creating a tone on set that felt relaxed and low pressure. I mean, I've learned of endless television directors who... <laughs> yeah, but by watching their movies, who, who are the directors that you, you know, in, aspire to compete with mentally, let's say, spar with, uh, versus those that you go, man, I don't want to do anything like that. What is that? Yeah, uh, gosh. I mean, I've been inspired by a lot of, like I said, I love Kusaritsa, I love David Lynch, I love 
I mean, I used to be obsessed with Ilya Kazan. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm all over the map. <laughs> so uh, this might be a good moment to ask, how did you come to the parallels between Charlie, your Charlie and Chaplin? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> well, it started with like what t- talking to um, people that were in the Soviet Union in this time period and, and reading about like what was known of the West? What was, you know, what did people know about the West? What were the common sort of things? And very few, you know, p- people didn't know a lot. Right. Charlie Chaplin was a worldwide known phenomenon. Everybody knew Charlie Chaplin. So that was a little bit of it is, is just coming from like what they would call this guy. Like what would they identify? Look at this goofy man and what would they, you know, what would they call him? Um, so it was a little bit of that. Um, I mean, I think I it's really that. funny when Charlie, again, your Charlie comes out of prison. He walks like the little tramp. He pats himself down like the little tramp. He basically is the little tramp. I mean, in a sense, from the West, he's come to the Soviet Union and become a uh, a riches to rags story as opposed to mm-hmm. the opposite. Yeah, the... <laughs> It's funny because I almost, that was one of those, it was a moment that I was like, ah, it's got to be so, so subtle. It can't be over the top. And I almost cut that shot because it's only one (laughs) shot. I mean, there, you know, there's bits of, uh, I would even say more Buster Keaton than Charlie Chaplin in the film. Mm. But yeah, that little moment I was like, all right, well, at this point, if you're not with me, um, you know, <laughs> you don't like the movie anyway. <laughs> I, so I don't know where you are. If you're, you know, there are many more <laughs> layers to that, uh, Michael, such as verbal communication versus nonverbal communication. The Soviet Union punished you for what you said. So the the fact that he's reduced and it's a very deep thought that that you know he's reduced to. Uh, grimacing or mimicking or, 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 or miming what he thinks because that's safer than uh, saying anything. Like can you, you can imagine a person gets out of prison and just jumps to the first person he meets and says, can you imagine what they did to me? And then, you know, two minutes later, you'd be back in prison. So, right. so he can't do that. So he's learned to internalize also the entire experience with the window. And, you know, he lived all this time just through a window, right? So that's another way in which he couldn't participate, even though you had him beautifully saying things or muttering things, playing that role of uh, certain people in our community who apparently talks back to, to the movie theaters, <laughs> <laughs> in movie theaters to the, to the cinema. So you had him doing that, which was very nice. But he was muted. You know, the, the, what, what the Soviets did to you is muted you. So I wanted to speak at length about the filming of the window into the mm-hmm. neighboring couple's apartment scenes that animate and enliven this otherwise sad circ- his sad circumstances movie. How long a lens did you need to see movement and live action at that distance and with that much detail and live in this as you did? To me, that is the biggest off factor of this movie. The couple, the painting, the family celebrations, the drunk episodes, the, the painting equipment, hidden, found, flowers, so for fear of imprisonment, the love in this flawed pair, the hopelessness and reborn hope at every turn till it never returns again. How did you manage that technically? Well, um, <clears throat> it wasn't easy. Um, scenes in the apartment, we rehearsed like a play. And, you know, what ended up in the movie is probably a third of what we actually shot in terms of their, their scenes um, together. We shot, not to give too much away, but who cares? Um, people like behind the scenes stuff now. It, the apartment was on a sound stage. Um, we built it. And we actually built a wall that we had on the opposite side of the sound stage, a prison wall with bars and everything, and that we shot through across the stage to the apartment. When they were building the apartment, I remember, you know, small things like coming to the that and seeing what they were building and noticing the wood panels between the glass they were like and really wide they were like two inches wide and i was like oh my god this is that those two inches are gonna cover up 
thirty percent of what we see. Like it's it's a big de- that big deal, and you know, going through fighting with the set designers and put you know for them to redo it and reduce them down. To, they're like, but no, the, the windows in those days they would have panels that would. They, they, it's it's not authentic. It's not. And was like, I don't care about authentic. I care about like seeing the actors' faces. So they redid those panels to be thinner. <laughs> And then we, I, I've mentioned this before, we shot this film in 2020, right at the beginning of the pandemic. So we had shot probably about a week of the film, and then we had to shut down. We had to lock down. And uh, most of what we shot was the apartment stuff. We shot 50% of uh, Hovick and uh, the, the Tigran and Ruzanne scenes. And Hovick ended up having to go back to Spain because uh, his mother was in Madrid and he was concerned. And then there was the travel band. And so he couldn't get back. We couldn't get him back in the country. And it took months and months before we could get him back. So the one positive thing of this is I was able to look at all the footage. And one of the things in looking at the footage, I realized for the wider shots, it wasn't working. Even though we were all the on the other side of the soundstage, the apartment was just felt too close just way too close so when we finally were able to go back and shoot that again i ended up adding plate shots basically shots where it's just the apartment it's just the cell the prison wall it's just the cell bars separate all separately so that i could layer and push the apartment Mm. like create wider shots where the apartment is much further away um, to create the right amount of distance and be able to control it more. So it wasn't easy to, you know, that was a happy mistake uh, that we were able to correct. But yeah, finding and and figuring out how to slowly creep in as, you know, by the time we get to the scene where Tigran and Ruzan are, um, they're ha- he invites her back over to try to win her back and they have a big fight and she gets up. If you look at that scene, we're literally in a close up on Tigran in the apartment that's pretty much like almost a close up. And if you look at the beginning of the film, we don't get we barely, you know, there's silhouettes almost in the windows. Right. Um so there is a slow progression as the film goes on. We get closer, the sense of getting closer and closer and closer and closer and then finding the right time to jump back to you know, when they move out of the apartment, those shots are much wider again, helping to kind of show the distance. So it was, it took a lot of work, but... Um, it must have been an interesting experience to keep all those sets mostly intact over time, since you had such a long period of shooting and breaks in the middle. Yeah, well, luckily there aren't a whole lot of movies being made in Armenia, so uh, we were able to <laughs> keep them on the sound stage yeah. for quite a while. Yeah, I guess that's yeah, a which benefit. Which too much trouble. Yeah. Yeah. So to me, that alone is a story like a dollhouse within the encasing of this movie. Why that? Instead of going to that apartment, it being his imagination or partially as he would have liked it to have been, as opposed to straight observation, which complicates the filming. I mean, did you consider that choice of, you know, sneaking in uh, through his imagination or otherwise or through the director's camera? into that apartment and hear the couple speak or was it important to always well we do we do at one point do that the party I, yeah but that's something that i feel like you got to earn you oh, know, yeah. You, oh yeah it's like keep keep us by by keeping it back and keeping us separate and staying out of the apartment when we finally go in there in his imagination it it it's more meaningful Sure, sure, sure. On a more abstract level, I'd like to ask you about the choices of Charlie learning, growing, enduring, as opposed to passively observing. Even in this prison, learning to become Armenian, not giving up, not changing his mind, not veering from his path. That Herculean strength hidden behind the clown's exterior makes making the best of it, graduating as an Armenian, just like you two buddies from high school raised among Odars, director and producer, who make good 
with this magnificently subtle Amerigazzi. How did you decide, psychologically, if you take a mm -hmm. distance from Charlie's character, you could say, you know, he ought to fail a little. He, he ought to oh, not see. One message so much. And he's, you know, the thing that makes this movie work is he just, he's, you know, he doesn't he don't look it, <laughs> but he, he's getting an education on becoming an Armenian under the most dire of circumstances, which is right. every Armenian goes through, you know, an Armenian in India, an Armenian in Poland, you know, has to recreate an Armenia without much to go on, right? Yeah. Historically. So concept in, in I guess, more theater of the, the holy fool, and it's the idea that I think it might come from Commedia um, to really show what's going on with humanity. You kind of need an inhuman clown, <laughs> let's say. Um, I, what comes to mind is, I don't know if you remember the film Being There with Peter Sellers. Absolutely. Um, yeah, my favorite yeah. movies of all Absolutely. time. Absolutely. Yeah. So it's an example of that, which is here's somebody who's a little bit outside of reality who can better reflect the reality that the absurdities that we take for granted. And so in that regard, you know, it was a tough choice because I remember with the script, I had a lot of feedback of like, ah, the main character is just not real enough. He's too, too, two dimensional. Like nobody is that optimistic. Nobody is yeah. that, but it has except to be. Except Roberto Benini. <laughs> yeah. Except for Roberto Charlie Benini. Chaplin. <laughs> yeah. You kind I mean, th those are examples of holy fools. And, there haven't been a lot of films uh, of recent that use that technique, sure. mostly because we want like realism and we want, you know, everybody has to be suffering and grounded and real. And, and, you know, that's, it's good, but it's not the only way to make a film or tell a story. And so it's, it's a choice that I, I think started mostly with the script as a technique of being able to, uh, you can also, by doing that, you afford the audience, I think, greater emotion because you have it's a it's a way of creating some objectivity on life. Instead of being immersed in it, you are kind of like Charlie observing it when you have a character like that. Yeah, it's you observing Charlie, observing them and then observing ourselves through that, which is magnificent. So my final comment is to the audience, see this movie, because it's infinitely subtle, funny, heartwarming, horrific, and warm, like a hearth, a fire, a flicker, going out, coming back through booze, winters, snow, sunless, sunny, cranes nesting, and shaken by earthquakes in equal measure, all Armenian fate, Armenian destiny, on a merry-go-round of circular, circular storytelling, come join the journey. So whether it's a couple of high school buddies searching for their own Armenian roots through this American cultural quagmire, or a hapless chaplain esque character back in Soviet hell, the story is self-propelled magic. Congratulations, Michael. Thank you. Thank you, Vidros. What's next? How can Armenians band together and make wonderful movies going forward? What are your thoughts? I would say one, uh, for Armenians in general to uh, support more voices. We don't need to have the ultimate Schind Schindler's List style genocide film. That it would be great, but that's not really what we need is more voices, more different stories, and expand what Armenia, Armenian cinema is, uh, which should be a reflection of what Armenians are, which is incredibly diverse and rich. And I look at it as filmmaking isn't necessarily for me just retelling the past. It's not taking those past. You know, all, we don't need filmmakers to retell the story of Anahid or or the, you know, Vartan, you know, like, sure, we can have stuff like that. But we can also have all of that culture influence storytelling, that is the voice of the filmmaker. I think that's more important than just retelling who we are. We need new voices. So that would be my encouragement. Polyphony. Let's have Armenian 
cinematic polyphony. Yes. Yeah, that that's a good way to that's a good way to endure. Osped and I used to be in this thing called Arara uh, years ago, forty years ago or whatever. How long ago was that Osped? Eighties, right? You mean the high stand list? High stand list. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My computer was called Arara there. <laughs> Anyway, at, at, at a lab. But anyway, uh, and the key thing for us was how to live as Armenians. You know, this is what you're getting at is, you know, it's one thing to sort of look at the past, but another thing to do things today that have an Armenian stamp on it naturally, right? That's what mm -hmm. we miss as Armenians. And so we had this list of people from all over the world talking to each other. And my concern always was, you know, how do you make it? I paint, you know, how do you make your painting Armenian? How do you make your poem Armenian? Even though, of course, my interest in poetry and painting has nothing to do with being Armenian. But, you know, right. how to bring that in? Because that just makes it more spicy. Well, yeah. your art filters you, through you, basically. Yes, yes, I would say so. Let yeah. it filter through you. So what do you need um, to make better movies in the future, better aligned with what you want, that is? Less troublesome, less... Yeah. How do you keep your soul fed? Me personally, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Um, uh, I think having it's hard fought, but having real support from Armenians has been a difficult thing because we've been burnt so many times by, and I say that in the you know the most. <laughs> hopeful sense of that. I, I don't mean to be mean, but I think uh, Armenians tend to be a little skeptical, especially when it comes to things like film that, oh, this is just another scam. It's going to be terrible. It's going to. So like making this film, I went through a lot to try to get anybody to just get on board and believe that it would work. And and rightfully so. I don't expect I didn't expect people to automatically go, oh, we see the we see what you see this can be, this this film could be. Um, but at this point, I would say, I don't expect, I mean, I wouldn't want Armenians to suddenly go out and like, let's fund every random Armenian's idea for a film. Like, that would be stupid. But having, continuing to build a coalition of Armenians that can support each other, both from a high end of like successful Armenians, but also young Armenians that are starting out finding a way to make that more fluid. And I think it comes from more dialogue and talking and forums and things, podcasts. Mm -hmm. And for me personally, I would say like, I have a pretty strong filter in terms of what I will and won't do. Meaning I just want it to be good. <laughs> like, <laughs> I, I, like people go, Oh, well you, now you can make another film in Armenia. Like, yeah, I got to find the right film. I'm not just right. going to make anything. I got to find something that I'm passionate about. So, yeah. But this broke through the traditional Armenian genre, if we can call anything like that, because Amir Gatsi got shortlisted for an Oscar nomination for Best International Film. Unfortunately, it was cut from the final list of contenders, but it's still quite a feat, and it's a first for an Armenian movie. Can you tell us a little bit more about that journey, both artistically and probably politically as well? Because like it or not, there's a lot of politics behind nominations. Uh, so how did Armenia finally get a movie on the shortlist of 15? How much work did you have to do to get there? Well, a lot <laughs> uh, on both sides. One, you know, to begin with, I've been in Hollywood for, you know, I've been involved in the film industry, the entertainment industry for 30 plus years you have an emmy um, award what 30 years yeah. ago yeah so i have a inside view of like how political things are and how things work and looking at this particular category and going oh okay what has armenian been doing well it's just been finding you know i don't know how many films they've submitted maybe 12 maybe 15 over the years and they basically oh here's the film and then that's it and not understanding that, like, all of this is, you know, there's campaigning involved. That you can't just submit a film because no, if there's no reason people for people to see it, they're not going to see it. Right. And the way that it works is, you know, there's Academy voters. They look at the films. They first and foremost are going to see the ones that won Khan and won 
Berlin and one Venice and Toronto and Sundance. Those are the ones that they get all the attention. Mm -hmm. And you're just, I mean, you have no chance at all if you don't aren't uh, political about it and focused on and know how to campaign and know how it's done. So for me, that started with what kind of film you have to have a film that's accessible to non-Armenians. And so many of the Armenian films, if you're not Armenian, it's very hard to care about them. Right. Like, I'm sorry, but uh, even with the genocide, I mean, we found this with genocide films. It's very hard to get people who are not Armenian to care about it. They've got other things that they're worried about and thinking about. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm not to say that that isn't something we need more films about and, and better films about. But with Americazzi, I specifically want, went, let's make a movie that, like, the, the film doesn't have to take place in Armenia. You could tell the story. Right. In it, it's, a, it's an Armenian context, but it's actually quite a human story. That, first and foremost, was part of the campaign is to find a to have a story that audiences regardless of if they are armenian or not would relate to then in terms of you know it took a long time to get even armenia to agree to submit our film you know <laughs> the mm -hmm. politics over there is almost as bad as in hollywood right. um and getting them to go agree to like submit our film which sounds crazy because it's like how many films do they have but you know it's you know, like many things over there, it's about who knows who and favors to this relative and that relative. And so, for, you know, that was one thing. And then once we were submitted, knowing that it takes money and the right PR firm and the right marketing team and social media team to build the awareness needed to get these Academy of Voters go, hey, what is this Armenian film? What is it? I mean, this is the first time ever, like, we had stories in Variety and Hollywood Reporter and and all of these things that are the, the way in which these voters take notice for a film. We were, and I would say part of the reason that, we, as hard as we tried, part of the reason we didn't get fully nominated was most, if every single film that was nominated, either won Berlin or Cannes, or they started at the beginning of the year. Mm-hmm. Their campaign began in like, you know, February, March, April. That's when all of those films started. We started our campaign in September or not even September, like September, uh, October. Basically, we had like a very short period of time to get as much attention as possible. Whereas these films, you know, the zone of interest Academy members have known about for a year and like. Oh, already hands down, that film has been, they voted for. So understanding all this and understanding that, yes, for me as a filmmaker, the quality of the film matters tremendously. I, I don't think it's, I would hate to win an award or get nominated for something that I thought was not good. But the reason you get nominated or win awards is all politics and it is all campaigning and it it's, it's, that's the nature of the beast. As an artist, I don't really care so much. I mean, sure, my ego, I love to win an award, but that's not why I make movies. Right. The Academy yeah. Awards, though, I saw as an opportunity for Armenia. So much of what the rest of the world sees about Armenia is negative. It's negative. Uh, it's about this tragedy. It's about this war. It's about... You know, now this has happened or that we have so few things that are just positive. And this is one thing that we can feel proud of and that will bring attention to Armenia. People go, oh, they're making good films there. I want to know more about Armenia. It's just good. There's nothing bad about it. And for me, that's what we need more than anything. And honestly, I've had conversations with even, you know, high ranking officials in the military in Armenia, that it's almost down to national security mm. as far as the value of publicity and, and what a film can do in terms of, like, imagine this. Nobody is going to invade and destroy Paris 
because everybody knows like, well, that's the Eiffel Tower. Like you can't destroy that. You can't. Well, Yerevan could be, could go away. And most of the world wouldn't know, care at all because nobody knows Yerevan. But if Yerevan was a city that people saw on TV and knew that like from the TV show and they went, oh yeah, the steps and this, it's much harder to wipe that city off the map because of that attention. So to me, I feel like um, I looked at the Academy Awards as it's not so much about winning an award, but it's about the worldwide attention that you can get off of something that is the odds are actually, uh, that's the other thing is the odds are pretty good um, because for best international feature, every country gets to submit one film. Therefore, we're not competing against all of Germany and all of France and all of we're competing against one of their movies. So already we got some pretty good odds there. So <laughs> just in that, I was like, okay, this is really worth doing both for me as a filmmaker, but I also think for Armenia, it's a way of just bringing attention, good, good attention. So. Speaking of Armenian movies, Michael, uh, talk a little bit about, your impressions of at least the big ones, you know, like say Parajanov, of, of his genius, which is universally known and admired by cine cinephiles. I mean, I'm not saying, mm -hmm. you know, regular people know who Parajanov is, but, oh. but, 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 but I mean, you know, uh, the greatest movie makers in the world admire Parajanov. So that's, that's, uh, that's unquestionable. What are your thoughts? What are you, as a movie maker? I love Parajanov. I mean, it's hard not to be influenced by him. I think we need more Parajanovs. And what I mean is not people imitating Parajanov, but people that are like that you go, oh, that person has their own style and voice and they happen to be Armenian. I don't know what else to say, but I, I, um, a st I also like Parajanov from an artistic standpoint of it's so difficult to, I feel like there's two versions of filmmaking. There's the extreme art version where people can make you know something like Parjanov and maybe 10 people see it and then maybe if you're lucky after you're dead it somebody for some reason goes oh look at the genius of so and so and great or there's purely commercial filmmaking and there's very little middle ground um so i i think the more those two sides can come together the better um, where would you put Atome Goyan? <clears throat> with whom I watched your interview and he was so fawning over your movie. It was almost embarrassing to watch, but uh, what, what, what do you think of his movie making critically? Are we talking critically here? I've certainly criticized the hell out of it before. Uh, I, I love Adam. Um, I love him because he has a voice and it's his. And it like, I don't look at him as, you know, he's, he's achieved something that very, very few filmmakers ever achieve, which is, he is his films are seen because of him as a, a voice that's um, Sonnenberg people are other yeah, Canadians yeah he's an he's an auteur um yeah. it's very hard to like it's really really hard to find your way into that kind of status especially now because the industry has shifted further and further into these two opposites of well I mean really it's just one side which is commercial filmmaking American commercial filmmaking is spider-man and things like that um there's not e even the difference between like uh, you know the 1990s i was fortunate enough to as an actor be in a lot of indie films and weird ones that were trying weird things it's so hard to make films like that these days part of me going to make this film in armenia was because i can't make a film like america in america there's no space for for that just just as a mental exercise, you and me talking, how would we come up with a superhero, now that you mentioned this, who would be Armenian? <laughs> um, oh, I don't know. What would his um, superpower be? And don't say, no, did you? I would... <laughs> that might be a rhetorical question right there. But I've also always thought, I'm a sci-fi buff. I always think, what would be an Armenian science fiction movie or story? Yeah. Yeah. I, I, you know, I actually read, um, there's a guy, American Armenian, who's living in Yerevan now. He wrote something about, he was a, a military guy. He wrote something about um, Kandahar, but he writes science fiction novels. 
that are where the main characters are all Armenian. Mm -hmm. I haven't read any yet, but I, I learned about them online. Does that make it, and without knowing his stories, because I don't know um, who he is or anything, but does that make the science fiction an Armenian science fiction? Uh, this is just kind of a also a rhetorical question. Yeah, I just let's think, don't know what aspect takes it what from superpowers. Superpowers. Super <laughs> the great the, the Horovats uh, maker. Like he makes incredible Horovats. <laughs> <laughs> and he's got like those spear things that they they cook with that he uses giant quantities of throws he throws <laughs> yeah ah, there's a martial arts element so yeah. he spite he, he poisons the kebab throws yeah. it and skewers goes people. in your mouth and you yeah. can't help but eat it and you just so have to delicious. eat it yeah yeah so photobots thrower that's it that's it all right all right all right i think we solved that i'm problem. gonna wrap it up Yes. <laughs> yeah, that sounds like a wrap to me. Thank you, good guys. Luck. Thank All you, right. Michael. And Absolutely. good luck on your films. We look forward to talking with you again soon. Thank you so much for being on the Bye, show. Bye, Michael. Thank you so much. Thanks, guys. We've been talking with Michael Gurjian, who is an Armenian-American actor, filmmaker, and writer. He has won an Emmy Award for Outstanding Support Actor in a Miniseries or Special for his role as David Goodson in the television film David's Mother. As a director, Gurjan achieved recognition for his first major independent film, Illusion, which he wrote, directed, and starred alongside Hollywood legend Kirk Douglas. He wrote, directed, and starred in the critically acclaimed Amerigatsi, which we were talking about today, which marks a historic milestone for Armenian cinema as the first film submitted by Armenia to the Academy Awards to make the Oscar shortlist for the category of Best International Feature. Okay, Michael has dropped off. Pedros, do you have any afterthoughts on our discussion? I thought he went very well. I think, you know, he's, he's certainly uh, committed to being a uh, the best filmmaker he can be. And that's the sort of thing you want to encourage. You know, it's nice when Armenians shoot higher than some kind of parochial Armenian mindset. And he certainly has as a career, as he said, in movies and theater. And so... It's he's an asset to us, and, and it's just it's just wonderful to hear you and he express yourselves so well. I, I liked it. How about you, Arsbet? Well, I had a very good time listening and talking, Bedros. Uh, you remember how Michael said that they asked why does the Russian have to be the bad guy when he went to the Armenian Ministry of Culture, and he had twenty eighteen. That's right. He had to think a little bit about that, regardless of the fact that the more sadistic bad guy, as opposed to the opportunistic bad guy, was the Armenian Melikov. We should have asked more questions on that uh, to, to see if the current Armenian government's mood towards Russia actually helped in approving this film get made or not. I thought that was one interesting thing that maybe I think most we could certainly. Have... I think that's most certainly true. I thought your question actually had, in spirit, spirit, had something uh, to probe this issue, as a matter of fact. Yeah, two thoughts come to me immediately when you say that. One is Vaya Berberian's movie, mm -hmm. which does a much better twist on it, which is that every time he goes over to the ministry, he's promising them uh, Al Pacino. And because he's promising them Al Pacino, they're all excited and they want their jar <laughs> to be in the movie and they want this to be the movie. And that's, a, that's another angle to the same opportunism. And uh, the second thing I wanted to say is the yearning. I wanted to bring up to him, and I, I think I'm going to write to him and tell him about the yearning, this movie from 1990, mm -hmm. where the Armenian KGB officers beat the crap of this old man. And one of the one of the very touching scenes, and I think it's the sort of thing he might have done had he been aware of it or something, is they asked this very old man who made the mistake of walking to Turkey and coming back, so now they treat him as a spy to remember his uh, hometown, which is a gimmick, you know, sort of a kitsch gimmick. But they ask him, what do you think? And he says, I think I pray to God every day to bless his soul. <laughs> <laughs> See, it's a perfect answer. It yeah. sounds like he's being positive, but he's actually <laughs> shitting on it. So I thought that kind of thing is kind of nice. I've so. seen The Yearning, but I don't think I've seen Barbarian's movie. Um, one other thing, well, actually, there are a couple of other uh, thoughts that I have from uh, this conversation today. When I asked Michael about directing styles, I was trying to peg him to one of the main styles, whether he's an auteur style or a character and actor director or more of a classical narrative guy or whatever. 
we talked offline, I think, with him that he's obviously not at all like Egoyan, who's more of an auteur style. Anyway, the, the more I think about Michael, and also the things that he said make me believe that he's an actor. Oh, no, 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 no. he said it. No, he said it. Yeah. He's an actor director. He said, I've been an actor for the longest time. And so when I come to directing, uh, that's it's my to style. work with actors, he said. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Definitely. So I, I'm going to say he's a characters and actors director as opposed to action or pure narrative driven director. Oh, he definitely it's wants be, to be an auteur. There's yeah. no doubt about that. <laughs> but it's early times. It's early times. I That's exactly what I was driving at. As I was watching Amerigazzi, there were many scenes when I thought that he's got this Wes Anderson style super symmetry in frame architecture and the retro characters he was exploring, which is more along the lines of an auteur. Right. And Wes Anderson is considered more of an auteur style. So I think oh, maybe definitely Michael is going in that direction. I, I want to go further than that. I want to, I mean, there's a lot of things he said, which we can catch and refract back. And I'll, I'll do one now. And that is that he said he loves David Lynch. Yes. I brought up Lynch with the uh, voyeurism aspect. <laughs> you know, there's no Lynch without voyeurism. Um, what I was going to say in a glib way is, Give him a wide angle camera. This guy's going to be a panoramic filmmaker. It's just that, you know, the circumstances don't allow it. I can't imagine how much it costs to make this movie. What do you think? A couple of million bucks or something? You know, I don't have a very good sense of it, but uh, that makes sense. But being in Armenia, it was probably a little bit cheaper. Uh, and that's such a film school thing that we didn't even ask. Uh, what exactly. Is the budget it was horrible. <laughs> I wanted to. I wanted to. But, well, but let, my point let me is, give, it, give, him let me give us bucks. credit about that, though. Let me give us yes, credit yeah. about that. He didn't bring it up. Give him 10 million bucks. Look what he'll do. That's what yeah. I'm saying. Yeah. So. Um, a final afterthought on my part. When we asked, what do you need to keep making films and uh, keeping your soul fed to do that? I found his thoughts on garnering the support of the Armenian community of great interest. And maybe we should have explored a little bit more. Um, when he said that we Armenians hold back because we've been burned so many times uh, with bad projects and how we can overcome such stigma. Perhaps it's just going to take a few, you know, or rather not just a few, maybe a flow of good movies to convince Armenians that we are real Armenian directors and movies out there, every bit as good as any other Hollywood or, or Bollywood professional. Well, here, here's, here's my take on that. I, of course, this is an extremely important issue, and I thought about it. And I meant to bring it up, but I thought you wanted to wrap it up or whatever. I mean, it always happens, you know, we run out of time. But here's here's what I would say. The real key here is psychological. It's normalizing. It's mm -hmm. normalizing funding movies. And the way to do that is change the mechanism. This can't be about some Askayin Choch sitting in his living room with his mispa. <laughs> right. And the guy comes in and says, will you please fund my movie? You know, this, this is not the scene. It's Hagop Baronian should not be able to recognize the way we fund movies. Mm -hmm. And for that to happen, it has to be online. There has to be a community of filmmakers, a community of artists that expose what they're trying to do, you know, to the extent you can. I mean, there are copyright issues. You know, talk a narrative, and then people can just give money if they want to, you know, and, and a link to some Venmo thing. And then it should become easy. It should be easy for people and then to keep up with what's going on. Like, for instance, you put in money, you get to see daily rushes. You right. get to see filming happening. So, some kind of participatory way in which Armenians from all over the world, not just the bazillionaires, right? But, you know, people like you and me, uh, simple people, can actually help some movie maker make a big step forward. Like that Indian all-women bank, you know, that helps little entrepreneur women. Right. In Right. Kalpada, you know. So are we talking about, Bedros, are you talking about a national cinema or are you talking about a socialist cinema? That's a very interesting point. I wouldn't say socialist. Let it be uh, a cinema that mocks uh, big money, big ideas, big this, big that. The first Armenian movie ever made, by the way, in Georgia, in, in Tbilisi, very, very long time ago, which you might have seen, I've seen, is about mocking the rich guy with the fez, you know, and the big mustache, uh, being very cruel to a woman, you know, et cetera. So, so I think we need a sort of self-reflective cinema that is not gentle, but is loud, mm -hmm. that is bright, that is there. It says, I'm here. And through that, maybe the Armenian self-image of, you know, the little mis mis mesquin, you know, fearful guy trying to make it in the world to somebody who 
uh, stands tall and, uh, as the French say, en poignet la vie, just, just grabs life by the hand, you know, mm -hmm. carpe diem or something. We need a, a carpe diem Armenian consciousness being built. And what better way than through art and through projecting to the future, which is the role of cinema, or as um, famous poet Yeats has said, you know, poetry is the legislature of tomorrow, of the future. So let's legislate the Armenianness we want, you know, through film. That's that would be my wish. And Michael Gurjan would be a fantastic participant in such a thing. Michael, if you listen to this show, good luck. We want a lot of success for you. All right, Pedros, thanks for talking. Let's get together soon again. Bye, Asmed. Until next time in the next episode. All right. That was me and Bedros talking to Michael Gurjan. Dr. Bedros Afeyan is a theoretical physicist who works and lives in the Bay Area with his wife, Marine. He writes in Armenian and English and also paints and sculpts. He is the current editor of the literary Grung, which is at grung.org slash TLG. We'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye.